Hello and welcome to yet another video on how to be a great GM. In today's video, I answer a question that many of you have been asking, and that is, how do I prepare before a session? I'm afraid those of you that are hoping for copious amounts of notes and workbooks are going to be disappointed. I know how most of my players operate, and the way they operate is, if they see an adventure, they head in the opposite direction. So I have to make sure that whatever it is that I'm preparing will work for the particular group that I'm playing with. And in this case, it means I need to be prepared for them to go in every direction except the direction I want them to go in. So if you look at how I prep, I generally will create a few books that I work from. These books don't necessarily have to be covered nicely. They're just hardcover books that I can then use. Then, in terms of how do I prep, well, it's a bit of a mess. I usually write down a few notes. I call them episodes usually, and as you can see, hopefully, they are a disaster. The most important thing for me when coming up with an adventure is to jot down a few key features, perhaps to do some kind of diagram, and then to have a few notes here and there, and that's it. I really very seldom create more than a page's worth of notes for any given adventure. What I do do, however, um, is I generally speaking, and here an adventure, here's an adventure, for example, that I completely re removed. I completely said, this is a waste of life. I don't like this adventure. So as, it, as, as time goes on, my notes get less and less depending on the party or depending on the adventure. And there are a few things here that you hopefully will be able to see that I do almost all the time. And I'm going to take you through some of those as we get there. Now, what is critical, in my opinion, on how to create a good adventure, and if I come back here, you'll see even more notes. I'm a very visual kind of GM, so usually it's not lots of actual writing, but what's important is to know exactly what's going on and where things will or will not end up. And of course, the other important thing is to keep some basic notes of what the characters have done themselves, who they pissed off, who they taken to task on a subject and not come back to. So in this particular book, I write out the characters' names, I write down their goals, I write down their objectives, anything in particular, and I circle things or highlight things that are important. Then, of course, I start to fill out the world, I add in some notes, and then basically we just move on to the actual adventures, underlining certain things. Now, of course, if it's a mystery, and I think I have a mystery here, yes, the Half Moon. This was an adventure that I ran for a group of friends, and it effectively was a crime mystery. They had to solve a case of wrongfully accused murder before the accused was executed by the drow. That required a certain amount of uh, planning, and as you can see, my notes got worse and worse and worse um, until we catch up with where we are. But that's not really going to help you, is it? What's going to help you is for me to take you through how I do it and how I start. And it all boils down to a very basic principle, which you already know. How? Ooh. How? What am I saying how? Somebody wants something badly and is having difficulty getting it. That's the very basic point of most adventures. Whether that somebody's the party or the villain, it doesn't really matter. It's up to you to decide where you're going to explore. So let's create an adventure very quickly. This is how I do it. Generally speaking, the night before the session, I'll go, what were they doing last week? Oh, I can't remember. I'll ask them when they arrive. They arrive, I say, hey guys, what were you doing last week? Now, it's a double-sided question because the first answer that they give, oh, we were on the quest to find that stupid dragon thing. I try and determine their tone. Are they, are they excited? Are they enthusiastic about the adventure that they were on? Or were they rather disenchanted with it? 
If they were disenchanted with it, I know my very first goal is to end that adventure as fast as possible and start a new one. After all, they're there to have fun, not to slog through stuff. If, on the other hand, they say, oh, oh, we're, we're going we're gonna to backstab that Vulcan trader and take possession of all of his dilithium crystals because we've got this plan and we've got that plan and it's going to be amazing. Aha. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. That's what we're doing. So, of course, if we're in the middle of a mission, I don't need to really do too much. I do have to go back to my notes and refresh my own memory as to what I had kind of planned. So because I don't like sticking to a particular system, I'm going to create an adventure with you now, basically using, mm, what shall we use? Let's go with, hmm, what shall we use? When you've got so many to choose from, what shall you use? I'm trying to think of something that I haven't spoken about in the past. So let's go with a Warhammer 40k scenario. Warhammer 40k has got a very specific setting, but if you don't know it, it's basically the future is very, 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 very depressing. Everybody works for this giant emperor who takes a thousand souls every day to survive, and everyone thinks that they're absolutely marvelous as long as you're human. If you're not, well, you're about to get executed by this gigantic human empire that believes it's always right. Uh, they're all British too, by the way. So 40k, let's take a setting that the players are a bunch of Imperial Guard soldiers. They are the grunts of the army. They really have no chance of survival, but our players have decided to play them. And they have just finished a mission and they're currently sitting in their barracks. So I've got to try and think of something new. And something that I do try and do is go, well, if the last mission was a combat heavy mission, this mission should probably be some kind of thinking mission, some kind of problem solving mission. But because I know my players, they want a little bit of combat too. So what if we gave them a ghost story? That could be fairly interesting, and it sits well within the expectations of warp travel, which is when the starships they're on go to warp. They don't actually hyperspeed, they go into an alternate dimension filled with chaos and demonic beings that will try to seduce them or enslave them or plague them or do all sorts of manner of nasty things. So we're going to call this, and I like to give my adventures a heading because it just helps me focus on what we're trying to do. Uh, we're going to call this, um, let us say, Escape from the Dark. This is really just for us, and it helps me to remember the tone that I'm trying to set with it. So what's the adventure about? Well, our heroes need to survive on a derelict ship. That's the base point. Why is it difficult for them to survive? Which is infested with demons. But that's not particularly interesting, is it? That's kind of dull. That's pretty straightforward. Remember, it's about changing up expectations. That's what we expect. Unknown to the heroes, a force of dark Eldar. Don't worry if you don't know what they are. Think of them as drow or uh, dark elves or evil elves or twisted elves or pointy-eared Romulans. Uh, a force of dark Eldar have detected the ship and are trying to capture the demons for science experiments. Now, the reason why I kind of like that idea is because, as we said, we wanted to have combat, but we also wanted it to have a little bit of a thinking politics kind of game. What this sets up is a very interesting story, at least I think so, and it gives the players an opportunity to go in whichever direction they like, and we will have something for them to do. So, break it down, very simple. We've got several areas that we need to cover. They are, in no particular order, the ship itself. When we look at the ship, we go, well, what kind of movies feature people trapped in confined spaces? 
Oh, every horror movie ever made. People can't get away from where they are and they get haunted and hunted by something that's there. We could look at any kind of movie from the Aliens quadrilogy, soon to be a pentrilogy. Um, we could look at uh, the ship, uh, the, the movie called The Event Horizon or Event Horizon. People were trapped on a ship that had similar problems to this one. There are a number of references that we could turn to. So the ship itself. The ship needs to have collapsing doors slash rooms, shadows and echoes. This is more for tone. It needs to have traps. Okay, uh, we're going to solve some other questions a little bit later. Then we have the Dark Eldar. Do the Dark Eldar care about the heroes? No, they're humans. They're here for the demons. So provided that the humans stay out of the way, the Dark Eldar really don't care. But they're Dark Eldar and they're supposed to be intelligent, beguiling creatures who manipulate. So perhaps the Dark Eldar are going to try and cause the humans to help them trap the demons. This means the Dark Eldar come to human or hero rescue. So they are, and that's why I'm putting a big circle around it, they are going to come and save them. We're here to save you. We understand your ship is infected with demons. We offer you sanctuary aboard our vessel, but unfortunately we can't leave our space just yet because our ship was damaged rescuing you. You're going to have to go into your engine room and retrieve a certain power core which we will need in order to escape. Get the power core and make your way down this confined corridor into the cargo room where we can then take control of it and put it into our ship and we can all escape. There we go. So, that's our plot. The Dark Eldar want an engine core and we're going to come back to that one which heroes must retrieve to escape this is a ruse the core is a beacon to the demons will lure demons to heroes so Dark Eldar can use heroes as bait spelling aside so the Dark Eldar can use the humans as bait and I'm going to put a giant star here because, well, that's what's important. Then we have the demons themselves. Now, because we want this to be a thinky game, perhaps the demons are willing to help the humans. Unfortunately, there are two classes of demons because I'm thinking of why would the demons not be able to convince the humans to help them escape? Well, because there are two types of demons. And here comes a little arrow. Demon type 1 intelligent and resourceful demon wants to escape type 2 mindless bloodthirsty demons this gives the demons a wonderful type of conflict I want to work with you, but unfortunately my brethren have the intelligence and really just want to eat you. It's a bit of an inconvenience, but I'm sure we can work past it. Not likely, unless the humans try something. So there is our whole plan. Now, the humans could decide not to work with the, uh, the uh, um, uh, Dark Eldar and instead go killing all of the demons. In which case, what's going to happen? Well, the Dark Eldar are going to try and kill the humans before they can kill all the demons, because the Dark Eldar are here because they want to get hold of demons. If the humans are killing them all, they're going to stop the humans. The humans could decide to work with the demons, in which case then they have a, 
an advanced troop of highly sophisticated Dark Eldar already on board their ship. So that causes a problem too. Now, this is pretty much the total sum of my planning for the entire adventure. What I now do is now I will go to the Monster's Manual, the Bestiary, the Guide for Enemies, the Book of Dark People, whatever you want to call it, and I will go and find my demon stats, and I will jot down what page they're on. I'll find the Dark Eldar page and jot down what its stats are on. I won't write the stats out. Now, this is for a whole nother reason, and I suppose I should explain myself. Now, I look at any kind of statistic that's provided for me by the makers of the games for their creatures, and I look at them as a guide only. I will never run a traditional game where I have the monsters doing exactly what the books describe. As far as alignments or focuses or goals, I throw those immediately out the window. The creatures are there to do my bidding, I'm not there to use them to do their prescribed bidding, because everybody knows what their prescribed bidding is. Evil creatures don't necessarily have to be evil, and they certainly don't see themselves as being evil. Whether that is a bunch of Romulans who are plotting the downfall of the Federation, whether that is an Ithalid busy trying to work out how to take over the nearby human kingdom, I don't care. They will do what I want them to do. I use the statistics. The statistic, I use the. Wow. I use the statistics. I use the numbers and values that make up the creatures as a reference point. I look at that and I go, oh, an orc is supposed to have eight hit points. That means one hit is going to probably knock him down, maybe two. That's interesting. I want this combat to last a little bit longer or I want it to be a bit shorter. So the numbers are going to vary wildly. Also, as my characters go up in level or power, well, so do the same creatures. Otherwise, once you've defeated orcs at level 5, you're never going to see them again because, well, they just don't power up sufficiently. My general rule of thumb is if the players have a plus 5 to dual damage and a plus 5 to hit, my creatures will pretty much have the same, regardless of what the book says. I like fights that I can control, and I don't like spending days searching for one little monster that can fight off the uh, party at the equivalent level, blah, 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 whatever. So these are references so that I can look at and go, oh, well, they've got sonic powers. That's pretty cool, and that will inspire my uh, planning to go in that kind of direction, but that's about it. Then, pretty much finally, what I work out is I work out a list of names. So, for the demons, we have Belganatrix, uh, Voth, Goth, Hod, um, Glaugen, and let's say Brelka. Those are the names for the demons. For the Dark Eldar, uh, let's say we have um, Senjin Vorgaxi, let's say we have um, Talarin Sojournak, let's say we have Tenta Vis and let's see, uh, let's have uh, Brol Heldasinder. There we go. Those are some names. Now I have a few names. I can drop those in. If I need more, well, while the player is busy talking amongst themselves, I'll add to the list. Of course, we need a name for the starship, so uh, that they're originally on these marines. Um, let's call that the, uh, well, we want it to have something to do with escape from the dark, don't we? So let's call it the Lightbringer. Troop transport. Okay, and I circle that because it's important. And finally, the very last thing is to work out how does the adventure start. Do I need to have them being loaded onto the ship? Do I have the luxury of just starting them on the ship? Um, not really. So if we go in the example that they are in a spaceport, 
and I say, well, the Lightbringer has certainly got uh, capacity to carry you to the planet that you want to go to. And they go, no, I want to look for a rogue trader that has nothing to do with whatever adventure you set up. I'll go, absolutely. Right, so we have got the... Um, the darker horse which is captained captained uh, by um, Jin Sod. Jin Sod will fly you. And the darker horse, of course, is going to end up in exactly the same position as the Lightbringer would have brought. So it really doesn't matter what option they choose, they are going to end up in my adventure where they have a ship that is infected by demons and that have Dark Eldar trying to capture those demons. If I need some kind of map, I might very crudely draw the ship. And again, it doesn't matter whether it's the Dark Horse or the Lightbringer. And I will say, right, so we've got, say, mainly uh, here is where the heroes start. And here is the engine room. And here is the hangar plus demons. And here are the Dark Eldar camp, basically. And this, we will say, is flooded, fired, missing, exploding. Which brings us back to those traps that we were talking about. Here's a whole bunch that we now have. It could be flooded, could be burning, could be a vacuum, could be slowly crumbling and uh, compressing. They're all the traps that we need. Do we need to work out difficulties for those traps beforehand? Well, no, not so much, because if the heroes are busy running across the ship and they have taken a lot of damage and they still need to get to the Dark Eldar and the session's kind of winding down and I don't want to drag it out too much, those traps have suddenly become a lot easier. As a matter of fact, it's probably just become some kind of extended challenge where they need to beat a certain number of rolls and they get through the collapsing central tower and to the Dark Eldar and off they go. That really is, in a nutshell, how I would plan for some kind of mission. And then I would make notes. Maybe they make a deal with Glaugen the demon and uh, Glaugen decides to come back in several episodes later because they made a good impression on him or perhaps they betrayed him and he has come seeking vengeance. Perhaps it is Patenta Vis who has an axe to grind because they help the demons escape. Doesn't really matter. In terms of how does the whole thing then flow and follow through, once they're on the ship, everything is up to you in terms of timing. You could, for example, if they're on the Dark Horse or if they're on the Lightbringer, throw in a beginning brawl between the soldiers as they're about to punch into the Great Warp. The brawl is nothing and shouldn't do any kind of actual damage to the heroes, but it might set the top excuse me, it might set the tone that things are going downhill and are not necessarily what's expected. Once they're in the warp, you describe things, and of course you can go and look for visual material and references and things if you want to include that kind of thing. But once they're in the warp, then you have the ship breaking apart, collisions, all kinds of weird and wonderful things, and you introduce the Dark Eldar as led by Brol um, Hel Dasinger, or Das Cinder, um, Brol Haldastinder, however you want to pronounce it, it doesn't matter, they don't know what your original notes were. And Haldastinder is the leader of the, dra uh, the Dark Elves and wants to advance his goal. You could also have it that the heroes are on the run from one of these demons and as they come around the corner, the Dark Elves step out and save them, which would ingratiate the Dark Eldar to the heroes because they were saved by the demons. As a matter of fact, that's not necessarily a bad idea. So, and I think we've kind of got that idea. Um, the, we'll put it in here, the DE save heroes from demons. And I'll put a big exclamation mark here. And that is how I prepare for an adventure. I hope it has been maybe insightful in terms of the process 
and please let me know if you want me to break it down slower or further in terms of my process. I know I kind of sped through it here. Until next time, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, write those comments, leave suggestions, let's help each other learn better. I know a lot of people will plan a lot better than I will and will have better ways of perhaps working out encounters with challenge ratings and all those numbers and mathematics and that kind of thing. If you do, start your own channel. I strongly recommend it. It's very rewarding chatting to people out there and getting different perspectives. So until next time, happy gaming.